Whether you know it or not, when you're in a negative state of being, you need a coping mechanism. To some people, that's drinking, smoking, overeating, perhaps it's gossiping. You need some form of coping to get through the state of being that you're in. So for most people, they tend to find an outlet. They find a bar where they can drink, go socialize, hang out, talk and work through their emotions. Uh, same thing if you're at home smoking or drinking by yourself, you're talking to yourself and you're using these tools to help cope and deal with the current problem that you have. It's a form of escapism. And when you're using, utilizing these negative coping mechanisms, it likely doesn't place you in a more positive state. It places you in a place of escape, being able to temporarily remove yourself from that situation. And that removal can just be mental and emotional as well. You can still be in that same negative environment and remove yourself mentally and emotionally from there. Um, if you can find the space to physically remove yourself from those negative states, um, you're in a much better place. However, you still have to find a positive coping mechanism. Those positive coping mechanisms can still come in the form of other people. Uh, perhaps it's a mentor, it's a coach, could be a really good supportive friend that's gonna help talk you through the entire process, help you listen, engage your conscious ability to think through those negative states of being. But for the most part, you just need a positive outlook. That positive outlook comes in the form of changing your patterns of life. I talk about this a lot because in order for you to change your pattern of life, you have to identify all of the negative patterns in your life that you've wanted to change. Um, throughout my childhood growing up, there was just a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, a lot of escapism um, in my family and in my community. And I mean, for most Cambodian people, you're escaping the war in the 70s. You're escaping the Khmer Rouge, you're refugees. And going through all those traumatic escapes of escaping war and genocide, they needed a coping mechanism. So when you have the chance to physically remove yourself from that location, you find a community that you feel somewhat safe being around and you find your coping mechanism, whether it's through karaoke or gambling, cooking, drinking, those are all things that are familiar to me. But within those negative states of coping mechanisms, uh, you're not able to fully process what has happened you leave those traumatic events packed up tight inside and you're not able to release it. So what ends up happening is after you come out of these uh, negative coping mechanisms, when your hangover is done, uh, when you've lost a lot of your money gambling, when you've gone through your arguments within the household, you tend to release that out when you're in a sober state, when you're around the other people that you love. Um, those were the coping mechanisms that I learned. So as a young adult, going through my tumultuous years, um, not knowing how to socialize properly and not learning how to gauge my emotions, my reactions. Um, I also went through a period of just drinking, karaoke, partying, just as a way of being able to deal with the negative state of not being content, or should I say not being happy with where I was at in my life. And um, through those years, I blacked out plenty of times, just drank to a point of excess, and I justified it in the sense of I was a happy drunk and I was able to just socialize and be around people and it made me feel good for the time being. But for those next couple of days afterwards with the hangover and the shitty feeling, uh, perhaps the negative words or the conversations that didn't go so well, you have these moments of regret. You go through these moments of regress, regression. And um, it took me a lot of years to be able to move past those drinking phases to a point of just being able to drink socially from time to time. And um, even then in those states, more elevated, but I still didn't like the way that I felt physically. And uh, I ended up justifying it by saying, you know what, I don't drink anymore. I just smoke, smoking is better for me. And uh, just ended up smoking cannabis to a point of just excess. When I started smoking cannabis, it was when my dad passed away. So my father was involved in a homicide robbery when I was 16. I tell this story quite a bit, so it just seems like I've normalized it, but it's still events and a feeling that I haven't fully processed yet, and I realize that at the state that I'm in right now. Um, a week after my 16th birthday, my dad was set to pick up a custom computer for me, um, and he went out to the bank, he went to go get some cash. It's probably around like $1,200 or something, 
And uh, me and my cousin, we were waiting outside in our courtyard of our building in Flatbush in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, <clears throat> waiting for my dad, he didn't come back for a while. So we're playing handball in our courtyard of our building. And uh, we have an alleyway that leads from my basement apartment up to the street. <clears throat> Clearly I'm working through something right now. Uh, the ball rolls into the alleyway. And in this alleyway, uh, it's a place where homeless people come to sleep or take a piss. Drunk people come to just linger and wait out for a while because it's dark in that alleyway. So from the center courtyard through this alleyway, you can see the street. So all you see is a window of the alleyway entrance. And as I went to go get that handball that rolled over there, I see a figure that's laying on the floor, rolling around, uh, some stuff around him, and there's like some water on the floor. It perhaps looks like piss or something. When that happens, we go get somebody to come check it out with us. So I go get my cousin, I get my mom who's inside, and we walk through the alleyway, ready to chase off this homeless or drunk person. But it turns out it's my dad. <clears throat> my dad's laying on the floor, uh, groceries on the floor, bags torn up. The water that's on there, the fluid is from gallons of water. That water is just dripping all over the floor. So quickly we sit him up, we bring him to the street. It's about 3 p.m. So this is in the middle of the day, uh, summertime. And uh, we call 911. And uh, my dad's a very intelligent person. Uh, he's into politics. He was a scholarly gentleman, he was a professor at a college and uh, entrepreneur. And um, when the ambulance came, they asked him basic questions like, do you know where you are? Couldn't answer. Do you know who the president is? I knew for sure he knew who the president was. Do you know the answer? Couldn't really respond. So in this state, they take him to the hospital and he's in a coma for four days. During this coma for four days, I'm just learning my coping mechanism. And uh, it was the first time that someone brought weed over for me. And uh, I just ended up smoking four blunts a day. It was my first time and at four blunts a day, you wake up, you smoke, have breakfast, you smoke, lunch, you smoke, have dinner, you smoke. And we were able to get through that summer, the months of June, July, and August, right before school started again, just by going through this negative coping mechanism and tucking away that, that feeling, that emotion. And uh, my dad passed away after four days of it being in a coma. I watched his heart rate go down to zero. And um, that just carried on throughout my life. And there's been periods of time where I stopped smoking, picked it back up, stopped drinking, I picked it back up. But I realized through all those patterns in my life, I never really found a way to deal with what was going on inside. So 2020, I go through another tumultuous family relationship and uh, I had no other coping mechanism at that time. You know, I thought I had everything squared away pretty nicely, but when you don't have solid coping mechanisms in place, you resort to the old patterns that you knew. So again, just constantly smoking two, three, four blunts a day before tattooing, during tattooing, after tattooing. And it was just in this negative state of like, how do I deal with this loss in my familial relationship? And um, just having to part ways and having to move to New York, being with family there, still moving away from smoking every day, going through my fitness regimen. And during that time, that's when I entered the MDK project, the Modern Day Nights, and uh, <clears throat> found a really solid group of um, individuals, some men who were able to kind of guide me through uh, healthier coping mechanisms through expressing themselves, being able to journal and get your thoughts and your feelings out. Um, so first time I heard men talk about therapy, um, going through a fitness routine, and I ended up just immersing myself in this physical realm of being able to run ultra marathons and to go through um, you know, these different fitness challenges. And all those challenges were more mental and emotional than they were physical. The physical output was a very nice thing to have. It gave me a lot of confidence, a lot of energy, but you have to be able to find and deal with these negative states of being and come to a place of having these positive coping mechanisms. If you don't, you end up reverting back to your old patterns of life and you get the same results, those same negative relationships, those same negative feelings. It doesn't put you in a good state. So I just want you to reconsider what is your current state of being? What are your current coping mechanisms? And if you can find a way to move past those into positive states, 
you'll be in a way better place.